All right, our next story for the day. Uh, very interesting one. Disney Plus, 95 million people just cannot leave Hannah Montana or Wizards of Waverly Place alone. Yes, that's right, ladies and gentlemen. Disney Plus has passed 95 million streaming subscribers. And that, to me, is quite literally insane. It's really important to put this in context, okay? And here's the stat that's going to, I think, put this in context for everybody. It took Netflix... Um, it took Netflix four, it took Netflix nine years to reach 95 million subscribers. It took Disney 14 months. So that's the crazy thing to really understand here that the amount of time it took one of the biggest streaming giants in the world, or probably the biggest streaming giant in the world, Netflix to actually receive that much, uh, subscribers and attention and revenue. It took Disney 14 months. Now there's a couple of reasons why this happened. And this goes into my larger point about why I think Disney plus is going to win. Do I have a Disney Plus subscription? Yes. Now, I have a Disney Plus subscription, not because I care that much about Disney Plus, but because Verizon gave it to us for free because um, I have Verizon Fios and my whole family uses it. So that means that we have Disney Plus for free. I don't use Disney Plus. I don't watch Disney Plus, but here's why I think it's winning. A, Disney's catalog of content is beyond this world. I mean, like the type of content they have goes from The Lion King to Wizards of Waverly Place to the Mickey Mouse uh, Christmas carols, so, like the things that we grew up on, at least if you're, you know, at least 26 and under. And if you're older than that, then you definitely grew up on that stuff on cable television or through VCRs or through DVDs was the Snow Whites and the Wizards of the Waverly Place and the Lion Kings and, you know, the, 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 the Mickey Mouse and the, and the, the Donald Duck and the Goofy, Go- the Goofy, I don't know what the name is, Goofy, it's just Goofy, I'm talking... I don't know what a goofy goose. I don't know why I was going to say goofy goose, but those are the nostalgic elements of Disney plus that have really catapulted it into a next level. And that's why I personally think it was able to reach 95 million within 14 months that the catalog of content they have and, and, and the storytelling content that is just so different from everything else in the world is what makes Disney Disney, right? It's what makes Disney what it really is. Um, they are a storytelling company at the highest of levels. And Disney will tell you this because what they sell outside of the parks and the stuff, and we'll get into that, are stories. And they sell classic, timeless stories that stand the test of time. And that's the thing that I've been recognizing when it comes to content as I've been really trying to understand content more is if you are a personality or you're a communicator, or you're a brand that can stand the test of time because of what your brand message represents, because of the content that you put out there, because of how you have told your story, then you're going to win no matter what. Like you are always going to win because time is undefeated. So the question becomes, can your work stand the test of time? And because Disney has been able to have their content stand the test of time, that's why 95 million people in 14 months came to the service. Like there's only there's only so many biz dev deals you can do with like Verizon and putting Hulu and ESPN together and all that stuff and as, as a bundle. Like at the end of the day, if the content's not attractive to people, they're just not gonna come. They're not gonna pay the eight bucks a month that it takes to watch um, Lion King on demand, right? And the fact that they can have that in their back pocket, the fact that they can have you know uh, the ultimate Christmas present, which is one of those classic Disney movies that came out in the two thousand, in their back pocket is what makes Disney incredible. If you think about artists like Michael Jackson, the reason people still listen to Michael Jackson at the tune of like 30 million streams on Spotify a month is because his music stands the test of time. Like it's just that simple. If your content stands the test of time, you are going to be legendary and immortal. And there's gonna be a lot of money on the back end for whatever person is running your company or in charge of your content catalog uh, in the future. So the reason I thought this was really important is just to talk about how uh, Disney did did this. Their earnings per share were 32 cents adjusted versus a loss of 41 cents expected, um, which is pretty decent. And their revenue was 16.25 billion versus 15.9 billion. So they exceeded expectations. This is according to Rinfitiv. Um, but they obviously still don't have their parks open. And that's the big thing right now for Disney is like their company is purely staying alive based upon its direct to consumer leverage. Like if Disney plus did not exist, uh, the stock price is at like 190 right now. I think the stock price might be down to like 90 bucks as it was in March because the parks aren't open or the, or the, if the parks have been open, they're not open to the full scale, which they can be, which is a lot of revenue for Disney outside of the, the media part of the business. They're selling physical tickets to people to come at the tunes of hundreds of thousands per month. That is like just cut right and that's been cut for about a year so streaming really represents the 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 strong amount 
of Disney's revenue right now and Disney's ability to actually grow. Now, they also have this service called Hotstar, which my mom uses as well, that launched in India. So the average uh, price per customer or revenue per customer has been decreased because the price of Hotstar in India is, is cheaper than it is than purely Disney Plus in America. But the revenue that overall Disney Plus is able to bring in with Hotstar as well has been pretty big um, at the tunes of the billions and the billions of dollars. So yeah, I, I think that thing is really important. I think that the, the thing that's gonna be big here now is like, does Disney Plus recognize that the old media business, the Disney channels of the world, the ESPNs of the world are not suitable anymore or just don't matter that much anymore in the context of what they're actually trying to build? And this is the thing that's really important to understand. Disney makes most of a lot of its money off content, right? A lot of its money off content has been primarily based off of selling advertising during TV commercials. People are cutting the cord on TV. ESPN had like 110 million subscribers in 2009. Now it's down to like 83 million. Why? Because people are cutting the cord. They're not, I mean, I cut that. We don't have cable at our house anymore. Not only can we illegally stream basketball games online, which is the only thing I care about watching, most of the content that we want to see, so like First Take, which is a good debate show that I like on ESPN, it's on YouTube. And it's really easy to just consume that on YouTube without having to deal with anything. So I think it's very important to recognize how their entire business model is changing. The question now becomes, are they going to go all in? And I don't know, because there's a lot of money still in the traditional established legacy media business. Um, there's a lot of advertising dollars there. It's much easier and much more expensive for an advertisement on TV versus on like social media. And I guess they have to do the numbers, but I don't know if 95 million people paying eight bucks a month is more than charging $115,000 for like a 30 second ad spot, you know, multiple times a day. Like that, those numbers are, are comparable and they have to be understood in context. But if Disney decides to come out with Toy Story 5 and they're like, it's only available on Disney Plus, how many people would subscribe? How many people would be like, you know what? It's Toy Story Plus, like I've got to watch, or Aladdin 2 or something. Like, you know, again, the, the amount of nostalgia of content that that company has is is at the tunes of or the scope of billions of people who have been affected by that and that's not only in the states it can't be in the states right because america only has 330 million people so at that point you're talking about a global economy that cares about the same stories of mickey mouse and snow white and uh beauty and the beast and things of this nature the question becomes if disney in order for them to survive, needs to continue producing Wally -E and Up and things of that nature. That might be Pixar, but Pixar is on Disney Plus anyway, I believe. So the the point is for them to really get those stories to continue their legacy and their brand of being the best storytelling company in the world. They need to figure out: Are they going to deliver it through traditional media, through AMC, right, through movie theaters? Or is it going straight to Disney Plus? Because you could imagine if Aladdin 2 is coming out and it was actually good, it wasn't just some bullshit like a, a, a sequel. You could imagine, you know, in theaters, what? That would do like, I don't know, maybe two, 300 million first weekend or first month in box office. How many more subscribers is that to Disney Plus? Even if they only stay for a couple months. Like imagine you come to Disney Plus just to watch that movie. But you're like, all right, I'll give it a couple months and I'll cancel when I don't want it. That's like three months. Let's say you've stayed on. That's three times eight. That's $24. The average price for a movie ticket is probably like 15. So you're already, if you just keep someone entertained for the next three months, and they're likely going to stay longer than three months because, again, you're Disney and the stuff that you have is like insane in your catalog. Plus, if you hit them with the bundle for like ESPN and Hulu and all that stuff, there's just an exponential level amount of growth that I think can exist in the company based upon the nostalgic level of content that they've been able to capitalize on. Now, here's the larger point. Can Disney compete with Netflix? I don't know. Right now, my answer is no. Not only because Netflix has 100 million more subscribers, that's besides the point. Netflix is actually making content for other audiences. Like, 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 uh, yeah, Disney, you have Mandalorian and stuff like that, but but you're not making, you know, you, that, that which is like a, a show about a, uh, um, a guy who stalks his girl, right? And it's a really entertaining I don't know what that says about me. That doesn't say, I hopefully that no one takes that the wrong way, but it's a really entertaining portrayal of how this guy stalks this girl and the whole love thing behind it. Obviously for mature audiences, Disney not, Disney's not producing that. Like, like a Disney has to invest in original programming. That type of original programming is more types of stuff that goes to HBO lifetime. And recently as of Netflix, right? Is Disney producing the queen's gambit where there's drugs and there's sex and there's alcohol. That's not part of the Disney brand. So can Disney sustain 
continually producing the nostalgic Aladdins and Lion Kings of the world in a, in a world in which audiences are obviously craving more mature things. Now, Disney has obviously been able to survive uh, until now based upon staying within that sort of PG or PG-13 at most lane. The question is when you're direct to consumer and you're not just a movie every month, how do you get someone as a subscriber to continuously stay and pay $8 a month in addition to the other subscriptions they might have and not cancel if you don't diversify the type of content you're providing purely based upon the brand not allowing you to have that type of diversification in content because a you type of show is just weird on Disney Plus. I would definitely check it out if they were you know, saying to try it out, but the question becomes, is that in brand with Disney? Can they just pull up a Bridgerton? on Disney Plus. I, I don't think so. As of now, I don't think that's what their brand is made for. So we're going to obviously see where that goes. I think Disney has a long way to go before they actually compete with Netflix. Yes, the numbers are there in terms of subscribers. The question becomes, are there 100 million more subscribers, which may take them, you know, another year or two years to get? I know they got 95 million in 14 months. But again, that's the initial explosion. Can you actually keep up that rate of growth? Probably not. If they get to um, 200 million within the next decade, or the next, let's say five years, is not only is Netflix probably going to be at 300 million, but then the question becomes how much money do they have to spend to create those type of same nostalgic hits? Because every Disney movie that comes out or every Disney series is not, you know, the nostalgic, uh, you know, things of the world. It's cr good example is Sweet Life on Deck or Girl Meets World. Like these shows are not the That's So Ravens or Wizards of Waverly Place or Lizzie McGuire's of the world. Those shows to me were flops. Maybe it's because I didn't grow up in that generation and consume them like that, but they are not the timeless hits or the timeless Disney shows that we're talking about. Same thing with movies. You're not going to get a hit every time. You're not going to get frozen every time. So if that's the case, if you're not investing in diversifying your content, Apple's going to be diversifying their content, right? They've invested in in the morning show and really mature audiences and and, and, and and trying to create content that that is at a different pinpoint of level, obviously not the same nostalgic brand, but definitely competes with Netflix at some levels in terms of quality of content. So that becomes the question, can they sustain that nostalgic brand or do they have to diversify? I think eventually they're going to have to diversify. I don't know how they just stay kid-friendly forever when you're direct to consumer and most of your consumers are not kids. Right. Um, like, unless you just want parents to buy a subscription to Disney Plus forever. So, I guess we'll see what happens. But Disney Plus, 95 million subscribers, 95 million people as of now cannot leave Hannah Montana alone.